So I want to talk about uh, dog feeding Filecoin and my uh, team, the user experience improvement team. I'm responsible at the Filecoin Foundation for a bunch of different things, a bunch of our tech spend. Uh, uh, I oversee our security stuff, but um, I also head up this team. And what does the Uxit team do? We care about, we have this kind of motto, which is survival of the easiest, which is based on the idea that um, in, uh, it was the case in Web 2 that, that, that generally it didn't matter how much money you had, it didn't matter how much investors you had, it didn't matter whether you were Barnes & Noble, if somebody came along and their website was easier to use, they would end up beating you no matter how many resources you threw at it. And I think while we don't, we don't think about it in quite the same way in Web 3, I think it's, it is actually still the case. Um, usable sites always win. Um, uh, this, I, we don't have, we're not very much on branding or design. Uh, Danny, in a very early iteration when we were thinking up this project like two years ago, came up with this Unblockers logo because we're going to be called the Unblockers team and it had a, a plunger. It, um, you see why we don't do like visual design. Um, the current state of Web3, like I'm a gray haired Web1 and Web2 guy um, uh, and I'm kind of sort of have been surprised at some of the stuff I've seen over the last two years. Like we're still very tech led, we're very averse to observation, we don't like surveillance capitalism which means that we don't like observing what our users are doing which I think is a mistake. If you do it in aggregate it's okay. We build a lot of sites using the same frameworks and some of those frameworks are not particularly good. They have poor accessibility built into them so you repeat the mistakes of the framework designers. And we don't have much of a UX testing culture. Uh, the reason Web2 got good from the early days is because people like Flickr would test everything they did with live users and then improve the designs on what they did. And the key to it all was iteration which was going back and doing Going, going, you know, rather than just relying on your version 1.0 and pushing that out and then moving on to the next thing, doing a 1.1, a 1.2, a 1.3, eventually getting to a 2.0. And three years in, you know, we've been doing this massive build phase and I think we internally, or as the part of the Firecoin ecosystem, it's time to start thinking about being in maintenance mode, going back and visiting those projects and doing, them, doing some work on them again. The other thing is our audience is developers, and I think we give developers a bit of a hard time. Um, we tend to think, and I hear this from people, we think because they're used to dealing with difficult interfaces and because they're, they're super clever, they'll just deal with bad interfaces, and I think that's completely wrong. They're actually extremely goal-oriented, they're incredibly impatient, um, and they get, they're more intolerant of delay, and they're easily frustrated, and they're easily distracted. I think our documentation and our tooling is part of the marketing for the whole ecosystem. If we don't make it easy and enjoyable for developers to use our stuff, they'll want to go and play with other things. They'll go elsewhere. So we talk about dog fooding. Danny sort of came up with this. Actually, the term comes from Mozilla originally, and we, and we use it slightly differently. Um, we consider it to be like, basically, we will pick any part of the ecosystem in any tool, and we go and play test it, trying to do it from the point of view of a technically competent, not usually when I'm involved, but sometimes, but an inexperienced user. And we can do it with this with, with, with a front end website, we can do it with a command line tool, we can do it with a tutorial, we can do it with any part of the ecosystem can be tested by finding people in their target audience and then getting to have a play with it. And what we do when we go through that process is we put them in a room or sometimes over a Zoom call and we'll spend an hour or two observing them going through the process of trying to run that tool or use that tutorial and we'll capture the blockers that they encounter. Um, we have a standardized set of tools for doing this, which is a very fancy way of saying that we have a Miro template um, and the output that we give to people is a Miro board with all the problems that we captured and then also some thinking and some recommendations about how to fix it. One important thing is we don't like coming to teams in the ecosystem and going, hey, we tested your thing and we found all these problems. Now you've got an extra problem on top of your busy workload. If it's something where we can raise the PRs to fix the issues ourselves, we'll just go ahead and do that. And that's one of the joys of working in, in open source. Um, we're all about like finding solutions rather than raising more problems. Um, our guiding principle for everything that we do, and you can, you can tailor this to, to, to different things, a competent but inexperienced user should be able to successfully achieve their goal without running into bugs or needing to break out to refer to additional resources. So if someone's using your tutorial and they run into a bug in the core, normal course of using that, that's a mistake that you've made or that we've made and that we need to fix. If someone needs to go to Google because there's a missing step or some of the language it uses is not at all clear, that's a mistake. Someone should be able to get through that process without needing to break out and go and do a search for something else. It's okay, and we strongly encourage more linking, if they have to link to somewhere to read some background and then come back, but if the instructions as followed lead them into a dead end or an error message, or one thing we see quite a lot, if a screenshot of a particular process doesn't reflect the current state of that tool, then there's some work that needs to be done and we, have, you know, we need to improve things. 
Um, this is just a, a screenshot of the, uh, of, of the base template we do. In the top left is the participant section where we record the data. It's not super clear here. In the bottom right is where we put the recommendations and then the, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll give um, either some fixed UX or some screen grabs of that. Um, a specific example, this one's not quite, quite yet live. On the left-hand side, you can see the original. This is CID.contact. I don't know if Torfin is in the room or, or, and others, but um, hello. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see a bunch of post-it notes on the screen that capture places where we didn't understand what was going on on the page, where we didn't, couldn't work out what was going on. Um, you can add, and then on the right-hand side, you can see the changes and the improvements that, we, that we've made, which is basically make it more like Google, put the search engine search box above the page, and a bunch of changes to the styling and, uh, and, and the text that's on the page. What sites have we looked at? We've looked at filecoin.io, field.org. This is a, quite a long list. Um, the FEM uh, ERC20 tutorial, which was uh, not possible to complete when we looked at it. And we're just basically, we'll pick, we like working with sites anywhere in the ecosystem. They don't actually have to be part of stuff that PL are funding or that we're funding. Um, and we just have a very long list of ones that we're doing at. Um, what patterns do we see over and over again? Um, now that uh, the, a lot of the sites that we've built have been around for, you know, two or three years. We see a lot of dead links. We fixed uh, actually a couple of thousand broken links on Filecoin.io that, that have been there, mainly because it's a very fast-evolving ecosystem and people have tried experiments and they've built sites and those sites have gone away and lapsed and gone. But dead links are um, a problem because Google, as one of the things that Google does is assess the quality of your site by whether you're linking to dead sites or bad sites, or in some cases, actually one had been replaced by malware. So, how am I doing? Three minutes, right. So, the other thing we see an awful lot is huge unoptimized images, and like, yeah, okay, so we've all got, you know, fast devices, and we're on, you know, gigabit connections at home. It doesn't ma matter. It still is important to make sure that your sites are load fast, that they're efficient, um, we, and, and we see sometimes very egregious ones. I think 30 meg for a sort of, uh, background image not too dissimilar to the one on this slide was the, I don't know quite how that happened, but was, was the worst we've seen. Um, we see poor semantic HTML. You have to remember that Google is essentially a, um, uh, a, a blind reader using a text-to-speech, a text browser. Um, if it uses the H1s and H2s and all that traditional semantic HTML stuff that, that, that was important in Web2 to work out how to navigate your site and which bits uh, are important to promote and how important you are relative to all the other people using your same words. If you have JavaScript that blocks the ability of the Googlebot to navigate your site, it will not be indexing your site correctly. And failure to link. Quite often, we use a lot of technical language in the, in the ecosystem, and we don't link out to definitions of it. So again, it's that thing of people having to go away and take an extra step of hunting around to find their stuff. Missing steps, assumed or hidden knowledge. Like, we all are immersed in this ecosystem. We understand what all these t terms mean. We know what a po rep is. We know what post is. People coming to the associate system for the first time do not understand those things and need help. Um, image optimization, I just want to talk about very quickly. Uh, this is uh, some work we did on fill.org um, where we uh, did some automation um, to automatically convert images to their optimized forms. On the top, sorry, it probably isn't super clear. Uh, we took a whole bunch of images down. The one that's highlighted went down from 2.9 meg to 24K, and the page load time went down from 28 seconds to 7 seconds, which still, by Web 2 standards, would be appallingly slow, but is definitely uh, you know, a, a 4x improvement on what it was before. How can we help you? How am I doing? Oh, look at that. Perfect. Um, uh, we can help you, you know, we basically love it when teams come to us and say, can you do one of these exercises for us? We can actually do it at any point in the process. You can have a site that's live and been live for two years. You can have a site that's just about to launch. You can have some sketches on a piece of paper and we will figure out a way in which we can put that in front of some of your users and see how they interact with it and see how it works for them. Um, and um, yeah, uh, uh, we, you know, we're really looking forward to, to helping other teams, you know, if you want to get some user testing done on your stuff, then hit me up. I am Stefan at field.org. Thank you very much.